um, the one chapter about styling text, um, and the other chapter about layout. Um, it, it's hard for me to say that one topic is more important than the other because, you know, all the topics are important, but the one uh, about layout, the chapter about layout is especially important. So we'll probably spend a pretty good amount of time on that one. We probably won't even wrap it up this week. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about stuff about text, but a lot of that stuff I think you can get from the book. So I'll mention some of the, hit some of the highlights and all that, but um, maybe some of the dotting the I's and crossing the T's you can get uh, from the book. Um, whereas I think it, it's, it's probably better for us to focus our time on the layout portion of this. All right, formatting text with CSS. We've seen a couple things that you can do and, and, and we'll just briefly review those before we move on. Um, one is we talked about the color and the background color. Um, and we, we've used that for our, since our very first example. I mean, it's, it's important to realize that when you're styling text, the key is the amount of contrast between the background and the foreground color. Typically, a light background with dark text is a little bit easier on the eye. Um, so if you're reading a fair amount of stuff, um, that'll work. The other way around is also readable, but from what I hear, it tends to fatigue the eye some, the, the dark background and the light text. You can't go wrong. You can, you can hardly go wrong with white background and black text or dark text. I mean, that, that's kind of like, if you ain't got a better idea, go with that, right? Um, one thing I, I firmly believe, uh, and, and I think there's even some resources in Angel, is that there's time to be creative and there's time not to be creative and just do the obvious no-brainer. And, and unless you have a pretty good idea of, uh, of a good alternative, you, like I said, you can, you can hardly go wrong with white text and a black background on it. We talked a little bit about uh, fonts. Oh, one more thing about color. Um, you should not only use color to indicate some special meaning. For example, if you had a warning on your page that was important, that you wanted everyone to notice, you should not only make it red, you know, compared to black of the rest of the page. And why do I say you shouldn't only make it red? What's wrong with making a warning in red? It seems to make sense, right? Yes? Yeah, colorblind users, right? So, notice that I didn't say don't make warnings red. I said don't make warnings only red. So, if you're going to use color to designate some sort of special meaning, use that along with something else. Change the font, make it bigger, make it smaller, put it in italics. Um, so on. Any of those sort of techniques will work in addition to the color. So again, it's not that you don't want to use color for that, it's use color along with something else. For people that can see, uh, who, who can see the colors, it's, you know, so they got the message two different ways. They see this in italics and they see that it's in red. But for people that can distinguish a color, they can at least look and say, oh, that's in italics, that must be something that's special. All right. Um, font families we talked about, and again, typically you give a string of font families uh, because you don't know necessarily what's installed on each machine. Uh, for a font to display properly, it needs to be displayed, or it needs to be uh, installed on the machine. As such, um, you give a list of, of uh, fonts in, in order of priority and it will use, the browser will use the first one that it finds. The last one on the list typically is a generic font, either serif or sans serif, because if it doesn't have any of those fonts that you've specified, it will, it will use the browser's default serif or sans serif font. Let's look at this example and play around with it. Now keep in mind that what we talked about last week, 
as far as selectors go, all right, um, we can apply that um, across the board. So what we talked about selectors doesn't just relate to divs, for example. I know a lot of the examples I use divs. Um, and, and I probably will in future examples as well. But it applies really to anything. All right, so the use of selectors using the ID, using uh, the class, using the HTML tag name, all that really doesn't matter the particular thing that you're doing. All right, so anything I talk about with one, I could probably do with something else as well, um, w with another kind of tag. All right, here we have, let's go and open this in Notepad. And we'll open the CSS. Oops. And you see here we have our H2s in um, Garamond first, and if not that, Serif. Whereas by default, I declare the body of the page to be Helvetica, Ariel, Sans, Serif. Um, it's typically uh, a, a combination that you'll see a lot of times is a Sans Serif font for the, the body of the text and a Serif font for the headlines. Those Serifs are nice and help people distinguish and able to read things when they're big enough. When they're smaller, they just, when the letters are smaller, they just sort of get in the way. Now again, do keep in mind when you see an example of this, I'm, I'm just demonstrating a lot of things. I don't think it's a particularly good design that everything's in a whole bunch of different colors. All right? Uh, because then at that point, it doesn't become meaningful, the fact that I have different colors. All right? So you want to use colors uh, judiciously when, when, when you're doing that. One thing I think we talked about, and if we did, we'll review. If not, we'll cover it, is... The font size being 1M, all right, E-M. That relates to the amount of emphasis that you're going to put on something, with 1 being sort of the baseline. So 1 is normal, all right? Anything bigger than 1 uh, will make the font bigger, and so 2M will be twice as big as sort of the normal font. 0.7 E-M will be, you know, 70% uh, of the font. Typically, that's the preferred unit uh, that we use to put font sizes in. Now, this is something that sort of changed over the years because in the old days, there, there was, uh, you were limited in how you could zoom a, uh, a window within a browser. But now, it doesn't matter how you declare the size of stuff. It used to be in the old days, let's see if they even have it. Yeah, I, I didn't want the zoom. I wanted the, the font. Yeah. In older browsers, you would have where you could resize a font only if the font was, was styled with M's or percentages. Whereas if you said 16 point or 16 pixel, it would keep it locked in at that. But the zooming in the browser has gotten better, so you can zoom in and it will zoom in regardless of that. So in some respects, that's lesser of an, of, of an issue. Typically, though, again, we will use percentages um, or M's to designate that. Um, the equivalent of 1 M would be 100%. So 0.7 M's, I could likewise style that as 70%, and it would work about the same. W3Schools has some good examples of styling text if you go into their CSS section. Saying the color of text. Setting the alignment of the text, all right, 
Let's go and play with that a little bit. Let's go and make H2s, or let's go and make H1s align to the right. Text align right. Notice then that that is over to that side of the page. So it can give a nice variety, make it stand out a little bit. Keep in mind, all these things that we are talking about ought to be done purposefully. They ought to be done with a purpose and not just to, to you know, you just because you can. It's a great way to put it, all right? Um, in other words, by putting that off to the side, that sort of sets it off. And we can look at that and we can see, you know, hey, um, that's the heading of the page. It, it makes it really stand out maybe a little bit more. So maybe that would be a good thing to do. Some of the other things that we can do, and we can either, we can text align center, we can text align right, we can text align left, and we can also justify. And justify is where you have sort of the neat uh, columns like you have in a newspaper. Notice that the columns of this line up on both margins. And they do that by putting extra spaces in between things to get it to line up. You don't have to go and count those manually when you're doing a web page and add extra spaces. And you laugh, but when I was in high school for the school newspaper, we used typewriters. And when we wanted to justify, we, we had, the, the columns were 28 spaces, I think, 32 spaces, or something like that. We would physically count the number of spaces and then say, okay, we, want a net, we need an extra space between doctor and church, or president and church, let's say. And, and then you would retype the article and you'd get it justified. And of course, you'd count it wrong, so you'd have to go and, and, and do that. Um, do it over, you know, and type it over. It is better than when my brothers and sisters were in high school, uh, chiseling it on tablets of stone. <laughs> but still, it wasn't, wasn't a lot of fun, all right, doing it that way. So, but anyhow, you can text a line. Notice also that you can center. And so if we wanted to center this, we could say text align center on the H1 and would get that. That's a lot better than what, uh, that's a lot better way of doing it, doing it via CSS than, than some folks, again, that had learned some HTML prior, used the center tag to do that or put a, a text align attribute on the HTML. Remember, anything that deals with the appearance of the page, we want to control via CSS. And if you don't know how to do it, look, research, you know, ask me. But you should not put things in your HTML page that controls the, the appearance. So a center tag, even though there's old center tags back from the bad old days before CSS was used uh, a lot, but again, you should avoid using them. <coughs> Let's see. Text decoration. You can put an overline, a line through, an underline. It says you can use a blink, but do not ever use a text decoration of blink. All right. I would also urge you not to use underline except for link. And the reason for that is people have the expectation that text is, uh, that's underlined is, is a link, all right? It's just, you know, uh, Jacob Nielsen, a famous web designer, has, has something he calls Nielsen's Law. And that is that no matter how good your website is, people spend more time on other people's websites than they do on yours, right? You know? Um, and by convention, links are underlined. So if you're doing something like underlining important words, people are going to think that that's a link and are going to be confused when you click on it 
and it's not a link. Let me give you an example, one of the most annoying web pages, and I hope, I did, I hope they didn't fix it. I hate when I have good, bad examples and, and they, they fix them so they don't have the problem anymore. This is one of my one one of the one of the things that upsets me so much. All right. Here's an example. Northeast Ohio Jazz Calendar as of 10:12. Click more below for a complete Northeast Ohio Jazz Calendar. All right, so I'm going to sit here. You know how many hours of my life I've spent clicking on this, looking at my internet connection, running over to the to the router, make sure it's plugged in, and so on and so forth. That's not a link. That's just plain text that's blue and underlined. Why would you make text blue and underlined if it wasn't a link? That unless you intentionally wanted to deceive your users, uh, that's so unusable. Actually, you're supposed to click the word more over here. And that's. <sighs> well, yeah. Yeah. Just make it a link. Just say, you know, Northeast Ohio Jazz Calendar, blue and underlined. And you click on it and you go there. All right. But at any rate, I guess what I'm saying, the bigger issue is, is, uh, the fact that this is my five minutes a semester that I get to get my revenge on them for doing that and wasting all my time clicking on that link. The bigger picture or the bigger issue than that is you don't want to sort of um, ignore convention. All right. That is you don't want to do things radically different than what other people are doing. All right. And, and probably the most straightforward example of that is having blue text that's underlined People will see that and think it's a link. So I would say in general, do not underline text unless it's actually a link. So you can do it, as we've seen, and they give instructions on how to do it here, but generally speaking, you don't want to do it. All right. They have examples here of how you can convert everything to uppercase and everything to lowercase. All right. Indenting the text, indenting the first line of the text. Space between words, space between lines of text, and so on down the, the line. Capitalizing an uppercase. Uppercase, well, let's let's try it and find out. Alright. Capitalize, which the first this one has a class of uppercase, so that made that. Makes every letter uppercase. Capitalize makes the first letter in each word uppercase. Yeah. So like for titles or whatever, I, I suppose that could be beneficial. No, it isn't. Normally, normally when you uh, when you capitalize, uh, like capitalize to a title, like insignificant words like of the and all that, you don't capitalize. So. I, I, I'm not really convinced uh, of the usefulness of that, but I get, you know, it's there if you need it. Yes? Is there a way to, to include stop words inside CSS? Include what? Like a stop word, like a list of people. Not that I know of, no. Not, not, not that I'm aware of. Um, let's put it this way. If there was a way, It'd be harder than just typing in the title the way you would want it to appear anyhow, <laughs> right? So yeah, I, I I don't know that one. All right. So again, you you know you can almost tell the the, the topics that I'm more and less excited about. Formatting text it does isn't terribly exciting. All right. Uh, and most of the stuff you can pick up from the book and and you can pick up from this uh, these few examples. So. Do it and, and do it again because the whole idea of this is do it in a way that communicates. All right. Uh, we want to communicate precisely. 
our message. And we want to make sure our point is made very precisely and very clearly. It's like back when, you know, I remember back when I was in, who knows what grade it was, but like if, if you wrote in your, your paper, in, in your report, that, you know, the guy jumped out of the space capsule yesterday and it was cool. He went up in a balloon that was cool. And his, the suit that he was wearing was very cool. And the parachute expanded, which was cool. And if you use the same word over and over again, the problem is, is that you're not very precise in the way that you're communicating. All right? So therefore, that's why it's good to have a variety of words. Because then you can pick the exact right word. You know? Um, me and my daughter joke all the time about like if you watch cooking shows. If you if you watch cooking shows, the host or hostess on those shows always use certain like really like vivid words. Like it isn't that the soup is good, the soup is zesty, or the soup is robust, or the soup is this or that. And, and it is kind of funny in a way, but the idea is again. That they're, that they're trying to communicate very precisely their meaning and, and not just use standard cliche words. So, what does that apply here? All right? It applies here in how you style your text. All right? Style a text in a way that makes your meaning very clear. So use these techniques in a way that, that communicates and not just, as, as was said before, you can. On the other hand, don't avoid these either. Don't just say, well, you know, I'll just make it plain and simple and won't, don't do any formatting. No, if you have a few key words that, or a few key concepts or a few key phrases that you really want to emphasize, figure out a way to emphasize it in a way that will be clear to everyone that, hey, this, you know, this is an important paragraph because it's bigger than the other type or because it's in italics or because there's a border around it or whatever. That's your job as a communicator and as a, a visual communicator to figure out what you can do, not just to get the sort of the idea across, but to really very precisely get your exact meaning across to the people. And these formatting text things are things that can do it to a large degree. All right, I'm going to start a new example for this one. So let me go and copy this. And we're going to talk about layout. Now, before we do that, I want to review something that we probably have talked about, but we might not have spent a lot of time emphasizing. And that is the difference between a block tag and an inline tag. What is the difference between a block tag and an inline tag? Maybe we did not mention that in this class. Let me verify. This is CISS 216, right? Yeah. Block tags display on the same, or, or not on the same line, on the stack like blocks on top of each other. So if you have block tags, they get stacked like this. What's an inline tag? Well, one that doesn't do that. So, if you have an inline tag, it will be sort of stacked like this. What's an example of a block tag? Article, header, H1, you know, H2 through H6, paragraph, div, and so on. What's the difference, uh, well, what, what, what's an example of an inline tag? Images? What, what was one that you said? Oh, images? Okay. Uh, links are also inline tags. So, some of the, some of the uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about now pertains probably best to block tags, although aspects of it also pertain to inline tags. 
And the one thing that we're going to find is we can actually make block tags act like inline tags and inline tags act like block tags. All right. It really is amazing the amount of control that we can have. Uh, remember, there's the defaults that are built into the browser that a tag displays a certain way. But virtually everything about that we can change through our use of CSS. What we're going to study now is we're going to study what is called the CSS box model. All right. And I'm going to start with a block tag. And I'm going to start with an article. And I'm going to put in what is called Greek text. Have I talked about Greek text in this class? Greek text is not really Greek. All right. It is sort of a placeholder text. And graphic designers use it a lot um, when they want to, um, like as a placeholder. In other words, you know that there's going to be something there, but maybe you don't know the exact wording that's going to be there. And there's actually uh, you know, a website that you can go to generate some of this dummy text. I guess dummy text is another good word for it placeholder text. You should not have this in the final version of your site, obviously, because it's nonsense text. But, wow, what's this? Never heard of it. <laughs> yeah, right. So I'm going to go and I'm going to generate a couple of paragraphs of Greek text just to include in my example. And I'm going to copy and paste them. Into my page. That way when we look at this, we can actually see some text here instead of just empty space. All right, so let's go and view our web page. All right. So we have two paragraphs of just plain old text here. There we go. And we have our style sheet. Let me remove the style from it. There we go. So we have our two paragraphs. Again, the three tags that we've used in this example We have more than three, but the several tags that we use, the article, the H2, the paragraph, the other paragraph, and the end article are all block tags. So that's why we see things stacked on top of each other. Heading on the top, paragraph, paragraph. All right. Now, we're going to talk about what's called the CSS box model. And the CSS box model says that if we look at our little diagram here, you know, this could be our web page that we have right now, right? This is our H1 or whatever it is. This is our paragraph. This is our other paragraph. And they're st stacked on top of each other. The box model says that there are certain characteristics of every box of stuff on a web page. All right? And we can set those attributes to really do a lot and control the layout of the page. 
all right? And to start out, I'm going to put a background on each of these so that we can see where each of these boxes are, all right? So I'm going to go in here, I'm going to change that to an H1. And I'm going to go and I'm going to make H1s body. I will make having a background of black. Article. I will make having a background of white. H1, I'll make having a background of yellow. And finally, paragraphs I will make as having a background of red. I'm going to change the article to a div tag because I don't want to talk about browser compatibility right this second. and I'll change the style to reflect that as well. All right, that's what I wanted to see. So, the body is black, right? So, anything that isn't in one of those other tags is black, all right? My div is white, all right? which the white kind of goes from here to here, right? Except, kind of goes from here to here, except for the sections that are yellow and red, all right? In other words, if I were to get rid of this H1 background color, then the white extends over that. And the H1 then is yellow. And finally, the paragraph is red. All right? And we can see how each of these are little boxes, right? The div is a box. The H1 is a box. The paragraphs are boxes. And we can notice a couple things about the boxes. First of all, there's no space from the edge of the box to where the text starts. All right? No space at all. There is some space between the boxes, right? That's the little white that we see peeking through there. If there was no space between the paragraphs, for example, um, there'd be smash right up to each other and we wouldn't see any white at all. We'd just see the yellow, uh, the red, and then the other red. All right. What we're going to do is we're going to look at all the elements that we can set in our box. All right. So let me sketch this. This is our box and I'll start just by looking at the heading. But it applies to the other things as well. So right now our heading looks sort of like that. All right. 
Now, it doesn't look particularly good that the heading is smashed right up against the edge here. So I can add some space between the edge of the box and where the text starts. So I'm going to have my box look a little bit more like this. So everything isn't crammed right up to the side of the box. That is called the padding. All right? The padding is the space between the edge of the box and where the text begins. So in my H1, I'm going to put a padding of 50 pixels. Now again, a lot of times when I do these examples, I'll do them with really big numbers, so it's very obvious what it is I'm doing. All right. In this case, I do the H1 and I give a padding of 50 pixels. So if we go and save this and look at the page, Notice that there's a big gap between the edge of that and where the text starts. And that again is known as the padding. Maybe I'll make it a smaller number, maybe a more realistic number, something like 10. All right. Oops. Quite up to the edge of it. All right. Yes. Is that all around it? Yeah, that, that's a good question. The question is, and and this is a good one to start out with because I'm going to make some comments now, and they apply not just to panning, but they're going to apply to a bunch of other things as well. And the question was, is is that padding going around all four directions? And the answer is yes. If I say padding of 5 pixels, it's 5 pixels that way, that way, that way, and that way. Now again, if there's not enough content to fill it up, then we won't have that. But again, We'll, we'll see examples of that. So if I say padding of 5 pixels is 5 pixels in all directions. There's other ways that I can specify that though. I can specify padding dash top of 5 pixels. Let's go and do that in our style sheet. So if I go here and say padding dash top 10 pixels, notice now it's 10 from the top, but it's not anything on the side or bottom. Or if I make it more dramatic, 50 pixels. There's 50 pixels from the top, but nothing over uh, on, the, on the left and nothing from the bottom. So, if I say just padding, it'll give me the padding going around in four directions. If I say padding top, it'll give me just the padding on the top. And then I could specify, if I wanted to, other paddings. Like I could say padding bottom. and maybe have a padding of 10 pixels. All right, now there's 10 pixels on the bottom, 50 on the top. Or I could say padding left and give it 100 pixels. So that's 100 on the left, 10 on the bottom, 50 on top. So 
One way that we can specify padding is by giving each dimension individually. So padding dash top, padding dash bottom, padding dash left, padding dash right. So I can give each, all four of those independently of each other. That's one way. Second way is just to give one padding number and say padding 10 pixels. Then it's padding in all directions. There's one more way, and that's if I give a pair of numbers. If I say padding 10 pixels, colon 100 pixels, what it will do is it will go clockwise, and it will set the top padding as being 10 pixels, the right as being 100, the bottom as being 10 again, and the left as being 100. So it repeats it, it cycles around. So if I do this, like that, that's equivalent of saying I want 10 on the top, 100 on the right, then it repeats. 10 on the bottom, 100 on the left. So there I have a little bit of padding on the top and the bottom, I have a lot of padding on the left. Not in between them, no, because they're all part of the same style rule. We'll see more examples of this, that you can specify the same thing a couple different ways. And that you can control either everything about a particular property, or you can really fine tune and set each padding individually if you wanted to. All right. So you really do have a lot of control as far as formatting the page. All right. You really have a lot of control as far as formatting the page goes. Because you can say, ah, I want this padding, or I want the padding, but on the left to be this. I want the padding bold, but on the right to be that, and so on. All right. That's the padding. All right. Another thing that we can set is we can set the width of an element. And what's the width? Well, it makes sense. The width is how wide it is. And we can specify that a couple different ways. We can specify that with either an absolute number of pixels, or we can specify it with a percentage. So, for example, I could say this H1, I want to be... 600 width of 600 pixels. And if we look then, notice that the yellow area does not go all the way to the edge of the page because I've specified the width. Now if you don't specify the width of a block element, the width is 100% of the space. So we haven't specified the width of articles or paragraphs or H1s or anything like that throughout the semester. So the assumption was is that the width is 100%. Here we can specify a width and we can do it as a pixel and say, or a number of pixels. And I can say the width is 600 pixels and that then sets the width of it to be that. And it stays at that width regardless of what I do to the size of the screen. So those there, there's a horizontal scroll for the rest of the width. I can also do width in terms of percentage. So I could say I want to make the width 60% of, uh, of the page. And doesn't look much different there, but notice how it gets smaller as it goes across. Now, here's a trick 
that is confusing and there's really a whole history to this. All right, But I'll give you the short version today uh, and we'll save the long version for sometime in the future. When we talk about how much space something takes up, all right, it's not the width by itself. It's the width plus whatever padding is on it, plus whatever border, which we haven't talked about, plus whatever margin is associated with it. So, for example, if let's go back to making this 600 pixels. That H1 is not 600 pixels wide, even though we set the width to 600. How wide is that H1? Eight hundred. How did you get eight hundred? Right. I have the padding of the width is ten on the top, a hundred on the right, a hundred on the bottom. Oh, I'm sorry, 10 on the bottom, 100 on the left. So, 100 plus the width is 600 plus the other padding of 100 is a total of 800. So you've got to be careful about that. The padding and margin and border adds on to your width. All right? So, if we're going to draw a diagram of this, it would look like this. We have our box. This is the width of it. However, we also have to add the padding onto it to get how much space it actually takes up on the page. Think of the width as being the amount available for content, the content width, the, the, the amount of space you have to actually put stuff in. And then the padding goes on top of that. So if the width is 600 pixels and we have a padding of 100 and 100, the total width of this guy is going to be 800 pixels. Same thing works, by the way, with height. There's a height attribute, and if you add, you have to add the padding to the height attribute to see how much it is. Now, we've just started with this box model. There's two more components of it that add to the width and height. That is the border and the margin. In addition to that, there's things that we can do as far as positioning these blocks. And we'll get into all of that next time. All right, we'll see you up in lab.